I'm going to preach a message that might, I don't know, might rattle your cage a little bit. I am definitely going to be preaching this at a pastor's fellowship, which I'm probably going to get people mad at me. And I'm going to be sitting, going ahead and say some things here today that most likely you're going to get perturbed and mad at me. So today, please don't get offended. Look at what the scriptures got to say, because it is Christianity. It's biblical Christian supposed to be living. <laughs> Something that is missing. In, tell me if I'm wrong here when you hear this message, that it's missing in Christianity, because I'm telling you right now, I have probably ministered for the last three to four or five years people that should have should have been taken taken care of by those that call themselves pastors or elders in the church or grounded Christians and have ignored, listen now, keyword, have ignored the need because they're too busy doing other things like making the money, keeping their title up there, and keeping, you know, their image okay amongst the peers, okay? Just to let you know, this is one guy, I don't care, if you, what you see is what you get, man. You can, you can talk to Brother Harry Anderson. Who else have I taken on trips with me? The Solenskis. How I preach here is how I preach everywhere. And some people love me, and some people despise. <laughs> but, but I try to do it biblically in Scripture. Because it's not that, you know what it is, is that I bring it to the forefront and lay it out there. I love it. Look at it all. This is what, Sean. This is really, really funny. I love when I hear Pastor Tommy how tired they are. Okay, they're full time. They get paid full time. But I hear during the week they're tired because they went golfing for two times out of the week, and they had to help their wife do the gardening, and they had to work seventy eight hours on a sermon. Oh. This is when I was roofing. <laughs> but I'm roofing for 60 hours a week. I got to go ahead and answer there, but they're tired. They have it hard. I go, you're preaching to the wrong person, man. You need to get away from me. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. They act like they're dying. They're so taxed. It's like you have no clue. You have no clue. But you know what? I'm like, yeah, God, take care, take care of it, okay? But here's the deal. I want to share with you this morning. Something that Christians are afraid of nowadays. And basically they're going to use the same type of principles and maybe even verses during our business meeting this Thursday because it's essential. It is needed. You need to understand the importance of it when it comes to a Christian and why. Because it emulates something that you need that, that's missing today. And I'm going to show you signs why it's missing in church today. I'm going to show you signs why it's missing in our community today. I'm going to show you signs why... False religions on the rise, Christianity is on the decline. Okay? Here in Luke chapter 10, I want to share with you, we're going to read it in context. Luke chapter 10, I want to start in verse 26. Luke chapter 10, verse 26. I'm going to share you five things this morning. Bible-based principles in the Word of God. Luke chapter 10, verse 26 says this, And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? This is now a lawyer coming to the master. As in verse 25, we'll get in context. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, talking about Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to hear eternal life? And he said unto him, what, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and here's, here's a big one, <clears throat> and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. Hmm. Shalt live. What kind? Like you're going to die from it, or are you actually going to live? I mean live, like fulfilling life, okay? So let's go to verse 29. But he willingly to justify himself said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other what? Side. 
And likewise, a Levite, or when he was at, at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the what? The other side. But a certain Samaritan, which we're going to get to, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had, here you go, ready? Compassion on him. Compassion. It was amazing. Compassion. Wow. What else? And went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took up two pence and gave it to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? That's what he says, verse 37. And he said, he that showed... That's a missing item in Christianity today. I see more judgment than mercy. I see more condemnation than mercy. I, hear, I see more prejudice and hate and discrimination than what? Mercy. So it goes on but further, it says, He that showeth mercy in him, then Jesus said unto him, Go, and do thou what? Hey, since you learn, you want to go ahead and go do it now. Put yourself action. You know now the truth. You know how you've been instructed. You see the parable that I, read, I gave you. You see the difference. Now go and do likewise. Go do it. Pretty good challenge to that lawyer, huh? Put him to the test. Remember, Words are cheap. <laughs> Actions are great. Great value in action. What you see is a perfect example of <clears throat> what Jesus is trying to teach Christians today. Some ingredients that are missing. Compassion. Care. Mercy. Right? And each one of those things has something that's entailed that we don't want to do because it takes something for us to be able to come from our comfort zone to be able to do. But if you want to see true Christianity in action... We need to learn from the good Samaritan here, amen, the Samaritan, what we need to be. Now, what's really nice about the Samaritan is that this man understood what mercy was. A Samaritan was half Jew, half Gentile. He was a mixed breed. You know how mixed breeds were taken care of back then? They were shunned, they were looked down upon, they were despised. Okay? Now I want you to notice here in this portion of Scripture, this, this is all for introduction, the religious crowd, they want no part of it, they walked where? On the other side. They didn't want to acknowledge the need or see the gruesome if they stayed there, they kept their, themselves having to confront what? Reality. And that's what most Christians today do. They stay out of reality. It affected their comfort zone. They had their safety bubble that they had. And they want to stay in their safety bubble. And no one's going to mess their purple circle. <laughs> you know? Don't mess with my purple circle because I'll be jamming around my purple circle because that purple circle is, is comforting and happiness and joy. And I don't want to look at something that's discomforting, something that's gruesome, something that I don't have. I might have to act on my emotions to do something about it. I have never seen so many people sit there and run from reality of showing an opportunity to show true Christianity to a lost and dying world. To a, maybe a lost soul. That's now this man, look at now, this man, we don't know if he is saved, do we? This man right here, we don't know if he even knew exactly what was the difference between a Levite, right? Or a Samaritan. We don't know if it's uh, uh, a peanut pie don't interest, any of that stuff. All we know is that this person was in need. All we know is this person was going through to go ahead and try to hit, try to go ahead and, and hit a destined place, and he got interrupted and got hurt and damaged. But I want you to see here, this compassion can move you somewhere. But we're in a day and age where our heart will wax cold. Now I'm going to pray real quick here, and I'm going to share some thoughts and tell me, if I'm thinking right, what causes a Christian's heart to wax cold? Where compassion can't overcome. Compassion can't be the motivator to make a difference in another person's life. So I'm going to pray real quick because I'm going to try to make sure I'm, 
I'm minding God with this message. Father, again, thank you so much. Lord, I pray that you would put the words in my mouth, uh, in my mind, to project and to help us see the reality of the type of Christian we need to be here with Jesus sharing a parable to a lawyer. Lord, I pray we would not be a Pharisee, a Levite, but a Samaritan this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, many times, when it comes to ministry, we're going to see here what the biggest motivators we, we don't want to... Uh, it seems like we're in church today, now we want, to, we want to control our emotions, but yet we want to let them loose. Let me give you an example. If the music and the bouncing ball and the concert on the platform is there, we want our emotions to go. But when it comes to, an, when it comes to actually ministering what God is to our life, to someone else, we stand back. Because that causes social interaction. That might have to be interaction of your life into another person's life. And we don't want to do that. And there's many reasons why. Because, first of all, we might think that we're imperfect, we're not qualified, or I don't want anybody to know about my secrets. The second reason is, is that I've been before and I got burned, and now I'm not doing it for nobody else ever again. And so you get a hard heart. Other times you go ahead, <clears throat> you pour it all out, and you never get a thank you. You never get a thank you. Okay? You never get a thank you. You put all this energy. And then, it might cost you something, which we're going to talk about, and you spend all that money and you get burned. Just being honest with you. See, see? Right? Come up here. Look up here. You get burned. Because of people doing things not according to the Scripture. According to the Bible, when it comes to some of the pastor behind the pulpit, to, the, to a person in a position of, of leadership, or a person in charge of a responsibility, or just point blank, a person who thinks they know it all, and destroys the spirit of compassion when it comes to a ministry. Now, I'm pretty sure this church is called what again? What is the name of the church? Charity. Oh, okay, Charity. What is Charity? I know, Jerry Lewis Telethon, right? That kind of charity we're talking about? No, no, no. We're talking about, I know, we should give everything away, healthy selfie church, right? No, it's not, no, 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 no. We've got to be still a good steward of what God gave us, amen? Whatever God gives us, we, let me tell you something. Whatever we get from, from, from other people's generosity or love, whatever, we try to distribute it very carefully and very, in a proper stewardship way, I mean, it's probably being a good steward of it, so it can last long and give it to the right people that need it. That's hard to do. We will make mistakes, okay? But we're trying to do it in a proper manner. All right? Just because we're giving to church doesn't mean you come and just grab and get. <laughs> you know what I mean? We want to give it pro properly. Like, like when you go ahead and we have, don we, we have a donation every Tuesday and Thursday. But one person shouldn't be taking 10 Danishes. If you want to take 10 Danishes, I'm probably going to give you 10 Danishes. <laughs> you know? No. <laughs> 10 Danishes should be distributed properly, right? 10 Danishes... You come here and you come, well, you come out of here with one bag. You should come out of here with one bag. A tops bag, not a garbage bag. There's a huge difference because that garbage bag could probably take care of ten other families, right? So when God blesses us with donations or salt like clothes, we got to make sure we give it to who it is. Don't walk out of here with ten pairs of jeans. No, grab, grab a couple you need. Just wait for somebody else. Amen? Right? So what I'm trying to say is we got to be a good steward of it. But people keep seeing injustice. Look at now. Look up here. We see injustice in how we show compassion and care for things. And now I'm not going to do nothing because there's an injustice. Hey, let me ask you a question. Does God know all this? Yes. yes. I'm not going to church no more because there's an injustice. Well, welcome to life because it's in the workplace. It's in people's families. It's in politics. There isn't politics. And guess what? It's definitely going to be in the church house. Because you're dealing with people. Simple people. And we're not, look at now, look up here. We're not Muslims. We're Christians. We're not going to do any beheadings. And we're not going to be doing no stonings. 
And we're not throwing eight people out the window at the top, top floor. Does God know? What you shall reap. The truth will come out, right? And you will be exposed. Of your, you doing things. Will be, it will be dealt with, but it will be dealt with properly. So when you're looking for a beheading, <laughs> it's not going to happen here. Because we're not, we're Christians, not Muslims. Boy, I know, I see you guys looking like, oh my God. Okay? We're not, look at, we're not Pharisees. We don't have to be Pharisees and Levites. We need to be Samaritans. So listen, real quick. Compassion is the biggest component. If Christians got compassion again, imagine how many gospel tracts would get out. If Christians got compassion again, they would stop being so stingy while God has blessed them and start sharing some of their blessings to others that are in need, but doing it with great, proper discernment. Amen? Key word, proper discernment. Proper reasons. Proper motivations. And God knows. Right? Right? I had people come to me the last few years and say, I will never give of my money to the church ever again. So then you're coming here to church for what? If you're not going to give anything to church, you're not going to give anything or whatever, then what are you going to church for? You're supposed to, you're coming to get and not give. Do you know you come to church to get to do what with it? To give. Who gives you the money to survive? Who gives your heart to pump? Who gives you ear to breathe? Who gives you a brain? Who gives you who gave you truth of the word of God to keep it all to yourself? No. With compassion to give. There's a hungry soul out there that wants to hear the gospel. Are you gonna keep the gospel all to yourself? Right? If you see a need, are you gonna sit there and and, and be Scrooge at Christmas and count your pennies <laughs> and not give a dime to nothing? Oh my goodness. It breaks my heart. I'm just telling you, it breaks my heart. Because that's how God had intended it. God gave us such an inheritance, amen? Such so many blessings down here that we can share it for the good of all. For all. For all. That is your God-given talents and skills, right? The truth of the Word of God and the Gospel. And when we keep it to ourselves, you're going to get dried up. Because you're not given. You're not becoming that tool or that funnel of God's compassion, God's care, and God's truth. Am I on track so far? I know I got you mad already, but I love you. I'm biblical here, tell me. Stand right up and say, you're all biblical! But I'm pretty sure this passage clears it all up, right? You're playing with my emotions! I can't play with your emotions. Okay? I'm not running a cult here. I'm just telling you, look and tell me which one of these three here got a greater joy and a greater blessing and did exactly what God wanted to do. It was that Samaritan. And that's Bible. Now I'm going to show you some things here. Ready? Now I'm going to do my drive-by shooting. Just real quick with the five points. Ready? Number one. This Samaritan looked at, look at now, he, he based his, his compassion was based on a need not a worth of return. Do you see that? Well, if I go ahead and take care of this guy, it's all beat up, he's bloody all over the place, and he's wounded, am I going to get any return back from this turkey? Maybe I can get some free work out of the guy. Maybe he'll go ahead and he'll go ahead and, and go get some money and pay me a greater return. I'm going to put in maybe $100 in this guy and bandage him all up and feed him and clothe him and heal him heal up. Maybe not at all, I'll get 1000 bucks from his state, his state tax return or something. Do you see what I'm saying? This Samaritan didn't even think that way. A religious person thinks that way. Right? A religious person looks at you as a number, not a soul. What can I get out of you? That's religion and a cult. Christianity doesn't sit there. Christianity, a true pastor, a true Christian will look and say, how can I help this individual heal up and reach their potential for Jesus? Do you get that? So when I look at you, okay, I'm not trying to get a shakedown and you're trying to get money out of you, because I know some of you don't got no money. Okay? But the thing is, how can I get them to love Jesus greater? 
How can I get them to be faithful more to God? How can I see, show them greater things when they know they get more devoted to God? They can see great blessing, great peace, great joy in their heart. Because I'm going to tell you this right now, when it gets to the judgment seat, me as a pastor, knowing that there's a greater smile and a greater peace and a greater joy inside your heart, that's going to be greater than any money. Do you get it? I mean, I was with you. I can't wait to get to the judgment seat and say, you know what, you failed in some areas, but you did good in others. I already know that's how it's going to be, because I do fail. But I'm going to tell you this, you know what? Because I'm not in it for the money. Okay? And I know Joe has a lot of it. He ain't telling nobody. <laughs> I'm working with him every Saturday. I can't get nothing. I might get a little bit of Pringles chips in Arizona, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Well, that's once, yeah, that's once in a while, yeah. It's only a small one, too. So, anyways. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that this morning... We need to realize that we can be more work together, be more like a Samaritan and look at, at people, not based on what can I get out of them, but based on the need of what they need so we might have to give of ourselves to them. Uh, turn real quick into Matthew chapter 9, if you could. Matthew chapter 9. Let's go to our perfect example. Our perfect example is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? He's our greatest example more than anything we can see. So let's look at our Lord first and see what he says about it. Matthew chapter 9. And thank you for coming to Charity Baptist Church, the underdog, amen? <laughs> the underdog! <laughs> a lot of people say, we're the underdog. Okay, we're the underdog, amen. We don't have a lot of money, we can't do a lot of things that other big churches do, but I tell you what we do have, we have care and compassion. We're friendly, we love sinners, right? We love people, we want to see them grow. Can we keep that going? Can we build upon that? All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> look at verse 36. Let's talk about Jesus now. Jesus is right there, uh, uh, went about the cities and the villages, teaching the synagogues and all. He's coming up here. Now look at verse 36. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with what? He was moved. When a Christian can't get moved with compassion then you're hard, and you're callous, and you're distant from God. If you can't, if, you, if God can't get a hold of your heart and, and make the heart turn to mush, and, and, and we move with compassion, then you're hard to the things of God. You don't have the love of God in your life like you should. You don't have the closest to God like you should. Because when God sees things, the Lord says he's moved with compassion. Why is he moved with compassion? Let's look. He moved with compassion on them because they fainted. They got tired. They got weak. They got weary. They got wounded. They're straggling. They're dragging tail. They're, they're, they're skipping. They don't know what to do. They're lost. And we're scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith unto his disciples. He's trying to teach the disciples something. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. Which means you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to plan on looking at things differently now as a Christian and start getting moved with some kind of emotion of compassion and care. Don't have to turn here, but 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, verse 10 says this, As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, good stewards of the manifold, look at now, the manifold grace of God. Each one of us has something to give. We have something that we can share to another to uh, minister. And, 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 I mean, we should have the love of God in our life, should we not? We should have the truth of the gospel in our life, do we not? Because we're all saved. We have so much to give to others that we don't even know. But the problem is we don't because we, will not, we won't let God move us. We won't let the love of God in our life move us. We need to. And that's true Christianity. I see too many Christians going to church today. They plug in, and guess what? They plug what? Plug out. And you don't hear nothing about it. And then Sunday comes again, and they plug in, and guess what? And they plug out. They come to get, and they do nothing to give. What do you mean by give? Money to the church? No. To give to others. Maybe a wounded Christian that needs to be built up and encouraged and badged up and help along to get him back on track and set the example. Be there. A phone call away. Amen? A visit. Check on. That kind of stuff. To grow in grace. To build them up in the things of God. Invite the church to be part of the, the assembly, right? To be exhortated, to be edified, to be built up, to get some help, 
They get some hope. Increase their faith in the love of God. What I'm trying to say this morning is that we're too stuck on self and not stuck on somebody else that say has great need. We have something to give. The Samaritan saw when he was moved with compassion, saw he was it, it was based on a need, not a based on what the worth he was going to get in return. Number two, when he saw in his passage of scripture, he was his compassion, he saw, he, he had compassion, he felt something. We're in churches today, and, and Brother Mike mentioned this in, in during Sunday school, that there's a certain cookie cut cookie cut mold that you have to follow. They have their all programmed, like almost like robots. They say amen for everything because everybody else says amen. There's no more praise God or praise the Lord, no more hallelujahs. It's just amen all the time. The second thing is, too, is that we get so used to coming to church, we get, there's a formality or there's, there's a routine that goes robotic. We find lose touch. There's no more feelings any longer. Let me ask you a question. Christians do have feelings. Because you know why? Because God has feelings. Genesis, right? He was angry. He was angry at the evil continually. For God so loved. Isn't love an emotion? A feeling? Well, now you're getting mushy on us, Pastor Pete. No. For God commanded love towards us. Yeah. God has feelings. So guess what? You need to have feelings. Don't let anybody in. They're going to ask something out of you. Well, Feelings. You got your feelings got to be generated. Your your feelings got to be stimulated. Your feelings got to be moved by God, just so you can exercise true Christianity in this world. And if you don't, then you're acting like a religious person, not a Christian. True Christianity has feelings. True Christianity has feelings for something. Has feelings to a need. Has feelings to to sit there and 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 kind of like. Get to a point where, well, you're going to do something about it with your feelings. It's good to cry. It's good to rejoice. It's good to be happy, right? If you go to a church you're not happy, <laughs> with, the, with joy, joy, joy down in your heart, then we're in a heap, heap, heap of trouble. Right? God wants you to be moved to an altar to repent. God wants you to be moved to an altar to give thanks. God wants you to be, uh, uh, be moved to do something for someone in need. God wants you to move with the truth of society to share the gospel to a lost and dying soul. You see that person in ruins and in hurt and pain, and you walk right by. You walk right by. I've done it several times. Walk right by just like a Levi and a Pharisee. Because I'm too busy with what? My life. That Samaritan didn't. I'll turn over to 1 John chapter 4 if you could. Uh, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> Here the page is turning. 1 John chapter 4. When you get there, look at verse 19. 1 John chapter 4 verse 19 says this. Look at now. This is a relationship between you and God in this verse. We love him because what? So there's reciprocating. And now God shows us that it's a two-way street. Right? Because of that relationship that was started between you and him when you got saved and born again. Now, as a Christian, you hear thousands of verses in the Bible. Love one another, right? Serve one another. Pray one another. Teach one another. Exhort one another over and over with one another. God is in the relationship business. I don't want to talk to nobody. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not productive as a Christian. I don't want to be bothered by nobody. And that's why you're miserable. I no, if I get too close, I know I have to sacrifice something up to help that person. So basically you're saying, God, I know you're going to convict me. The Holy Spirit's going to convict me. I know it. I'm going to have to do something. I know it's going to bite me. I know it's going to get me right back. And I don't want to get everything. Don't, don't, Lord, don't! Hmm. But yet, we love him because why? He first loved us. So when we go ahead and this, the Samaritan felt something. He felt the love that God, he understood the love for how God had for his life. And now he's trying to project it to this, to this poor, wounded Soul, 
and project the same type of love that God showed him because he was wounded in sin too. Amen? Think about that. Were we not all wounded in sin? And with his wounds and, and his stripes, he healed us. Now it's time for us to go ahead and do the same to the other. Because you know what? When, when people out there want to see true Christianity, it's based on how that Samaritan took care of business. And that's where you're going to show true Christianity, not just in word, but in deed, in action. In Galatians chapter 6, you have to turn there. I'll just read it to you. But brethren, if a man taken in a spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit meekness. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think of himself uh, to be something when he's not, then he deceive himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. So it's not, it's by communicating it. It's by interaction. You're going to have to interact, communicate, teach, talk with somebody else in order to help somebody else. That new Facebook page is just not only for prayer requests. Charity care mission. What it is, is we're, we're heading in a different direction. We got the friendliness going down pat. I'm hearing from a lot of people, we're not a mean church. Right? We're a friendly church. We got that down pat. We've been doing that for years. We're also a church that does, does reach out to the community and does some things on the community. Uh, with the Tuesday night soup kitchen night, uh, the, 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 the clothing pantry, the, the pantry on Thursday, donations that we have, hygiene kits, knitted hands, anybody can help the homeless, the ones that are in need. We do that, we can. Food basket here and there. Wherever we can. But what we're lacking is, is our Christianity actually demonstrated from your mouth and your heart and your life to another life. Verbally. Interactively. How many people are right now coming to your mind? I hope the Holy Spirit is reaching some people that maybe you should be reaching out to. You should be showing uh, the love of God in your life to them. Communicate the truth that God gave you about the gospel, about life to live abundantly and true, where you have true joy and true peace and true happiness. Then they're not living it because they don't have Jesus. Think about that. On that Facebook page is showing the direction of what we need to be doing. We're going to be talking about during our business meeting is showing greater care, but it's not just going to be with a food basket. It's going to be coming out of your mouth, I'm hoping. It's going to be coming demonstrated out of your heart. The same thing that God did for you out of your heart to another person's heart. See, why is that? Because you are demonstrating what Christ did for us when he left heaven to come down here on this earth to die for you and I. And we're going to go ahead and show that and demonstrate that with word and in deed. But it's going to have to make you, you're going to have to interact. That means you're going to have to sit there and talk. Which means you're going to have to spend, take a few minutes out of your day to interact. See, why is that? Because that's true Christianity. I don't see a lot of churches doing all that. I know a lot of churches have three, four, five hundred, and they can't even get five people to go soul on it. They can't even get six people to go on visitation. What does that tell you? They're so busy with their life, they can't give a little time to show Christianity to somebody else with the gospel. It doesn't have to be hours upon... It's not how many hours you put in to see how spiritual you are. It's the quality of what you do. Did you get that? Doing nothing is not... You can't do nothing. you got to do something. Why hide your light under a bushel? Why hide your Christianity? Oh, please, do something great for God. Here, you get the chance to restore. I have never, look up here, I'm going to share this with you. I have never, ever, ever, these past two years, seen so much hurt and pain with Christians that are in big, look up here, big churches. From the chapel to others. They're hurting in church and they feel so alone but yet they're amongst the masses. Be honest with you. Crying out, showing the signs and the pastoral staff of six or three or four can't acknowledge them to work on their lack of discipleship to them. Was I, was I too nasty on Thursday? Who was here Thursday? Was I too nasty Thursday? 
Was I fired up though? Oh yeah, I was fired up. Because we got biblical discipleship all wrong. Let's just plug them in the church, right? And, and do a bunch of lessons. No. No, no. Biblical discipleship is, is one Christian teaching another new Christian. Paul did it with Timothy and Titus. I, I grew more when someone spent more time with me one-on-one, -on -one, where I learned more with that one-on-one -on -one than I did in the classroom setting at a, at a church. Because some of you got personal with me because he got personal with me. Did you get that? You will grow greater in grace when, when, you, when you interact socially over the phone and, and pick brains and ask questions and, and hang around the fellowship of God and, and learn to absorb like a sponge. You will go greater in the faith. Here the Samaritan felt something. He saw a wound. He, he demonstrated his love to another. Number three, not only... They look at the need and based it on not return, but the need itself, and felt something when he was with his compassion, but he does something about it. Does he not? Turn back over if you could to Luke chapter 10. Turn back over. He does something about it. Look at all that he's engulfed in this whole entire situation here. The whole entire thing. He went ahead and he did something about it. And turn to Luke chapter 10. I want you to look at this again. Look at all that he does. All that he does in Luke chapter 10, as I hear the pages turn over there, I'll get this reference over here. Ready? Okay. Luke chapter 10. Look here. When he was moved in verse 33, he, was, he saw and had compassion. I'm looking now. Verse 34 and 35. Look what he does. And went to him and bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an end and took care of him. He actually did some physical work to take care and does something about it physically. Now let's go a bit further. And on, the, and on the morrow he departed and he took out two pence and gave the host and said unto him, Take care of him and what thou spendest more, I come again and I will repay thee. So now is he not, he's actually now, now is he emotionally given himself over to this guy with the feelings, but now he's physically doing something out there, helping the wounds out, bounding them up, taking them on his beast, trailing them over to the inn, and now he's spending money on them. He's taking money out of his hard pocket to take care of a need to make a difference in one's life. Who else did that? Christ did. Did he not pay? He had to pay for something, didn't he? Did he physically come down here on the earth and die on the cross physically? Was it an emotional strain on his life? You heard him. Said, Father, Father, why have thou forsaken? He felt abandoned and alone. When he was on the cross at Calvary, he felt abandoned alone because he took all the sin on his life for you and I, and God had to separate himself from him because he was sick. There was an emotional wrenching. There was a physical giving and sacrifice. There was a, look at, he paid the cost with his own blood, body, and life for you and I so we can have life. This man did all that. This man did all that. He did something about it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll read this here, verse 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, mercies, and of God of all comfort. Look at now, verse 4. Who comfort us all, us all, us in all our tribulations, look at now, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort of we have we ourselves are comforted for God. See, when God does things in our life, it's just not for us. When you're going through a heartache and pain and hurt, God comes in and comforts you and, and guides you and blesses you and does what he has to do. It's not just for you to get comforted. It's to teach others how they can get the same comfort from God as you did. Amen? Everything you got from God is not for you, just for you. It's for teach others you can get the same thing if you let the Holy Spirit run through. The Word of God seed. You let the Holy Spirit take over. Love, comfort, joy, peace, blessing. Amen? It's not all yours. It's for yours to share to others. Amen? Hey, I'm going to tell you this right now. Christine, God is good. And if, you, if, he's, if, he's, if he's this good right now, wait till he, how he is next year. You just got to keep on going. Every day 
is a new day. God shows himself truer and truer and greater and greater. And you think it's great now. Wait till a year from now, two years from now, ten years from now. Don't stop. Keep it going. Because you just got a little taste of it now. Uh, turn, uh, turn over to Romans chapter 12 real quick. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Here's a good one. Ready? I'm going to rub you right now like a Brillo pad. Ready? <clears throat> Don't get mad at me now. Brillo pad. Brillo pad. Here you go. Romans chapter 12. Look at verse 20. Therefore, here pages. I'll wait for the page to stop. Romans chapter 12. I hear pages. I hear pages. Romans, Romans chapter 12. Verse 20. Ready? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, slap him, right? Does it say there? Oh, does it say slap him? If thine enemy hunger, talk, I know, tell him. Go by faith, brother. Live by faith. Get a job. Right? Get a stinking job. Now you, got, now you know what faith is, right? What does it say there? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. And if he thirsts, tell him to suck it up. Right? Try to find saliva in you. Now, it said, if he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing thou keep you, you shall heap coals of fire on his, on his head. Because what are you doing now? Be not overcome with evil, but overcome with evil with what? Good. That's a hard one to do, ain't it? Because you want to knock them out. You want to get them, you want to get even with them, don't you? Huh? Who cares? What do you mean? Well, God will replace it. Give them half. Be the circle. I give you half of what I got. Right? Right? I have five chicken legs. I'll give you three. I'll eat two. So why is that? Because you know what? God's going to give it back to you somehow. Hey, this preacher has been burned so many times. I can't even begin to tell you. I could be here. I could write a whole book on it. But it's amazing how God came back and took care of what I gave up. And it's only by the grace of God. It has nothing to do with my smarts or my willpower or my uh, my uh, Monty Holland. You know, Monty Hall, let's make a deal thing. You know, I'm not I'm not burning. I'm not, I'm not burning. This this is basically what it is. And God has taken care of it. And I'm, I, I can't tell you. It comes from God, but I can't tell you where it's coming because I don't see it until it gets here. So listen, it's amazing when you do good on people. And I know I, down the road, that's why I hear, listen, look up here. This is why when I hear from people, I don't know if I can come back, Pastor. I feel so embarrassed. I don't know if, if you truly do forgive me. I don't know if the church will truly forgive me. But you know what? Because of that guilt that's on them. When even though you say, I've forgiven you a long time ago. The door's always been open for you. It's about time you woke up and came back. See, you hear them saying that? But it's hard for them because they're, they're, they're hanging on to that guilt of what they did wrong by taking advantage and doing evil instead of good onto God's people and God's ministry and God's church. Until they get closure on that. And you can tell them all you want. You can tell them a thousand times, but they're still carrying that, that feeling of, 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 of wrongdoing onto God's people and God's ministry. So I want to tell you this morning, he does something about it. It cost him something, didn't it? Cost some money, cost some pain, some aggravation, time, right? All those great commodities God gives us. But let me ask you a question. Jesus said that this is the man. That's truly a neighbor. Did he not in that passage in Luke chapter 10? Uh, since, we're, uh, turn over, since we're in Romans, right? Let's turn over to uh, Romans chapter 12 in the same chapter. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Romans. Uh, let's go down. Let's get that one. Let's go to 2 Corinthians instead. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's stay there because there's two verses in a row. I'm not, we'll stay in the same book then. 2 Corinthians. Well, look what Paul talks about here. Paul mentions the same thing about a cost. Do you know as a Christian we're always going to be paying a cost? Did you know that? 
Remember when you were lost, right? When you were lost and you were undone, who did you serve? Huh? You see, yourself, yourself, and it's exactly how Satan planned it out. Satan wants to serve, the, the, the devil's plan is to serve yourself. All for me, none for you. Oh, I love her. She's just like me. What you're saying is you love yourself greater than anything else. That's a big danger. No, you need to marry somebody that's not like you, so you can get all the bad stuff out of you and rub you like you, right? You beat him out of it, don't you, Casey? You beat all the bad stuff out of Sean, amen? <laughs> Sounds like a can't be embarrassing. No, listen, there's some, th there's some things I'm glad my wife you know, is there for me. You know why? Because there's some things I do wrong, and she goes, what are you doing? They tell you time that you're going to hurt somebody. You're being mean. No, I'm not being mean. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And I get mean. She, you know, she's like, you know, you got to have the checks and balances in your marriage, you know? Here, you know what? It costs something for this, the Samaritan to do. It costs him all that sweat and time and blood. Did it not cost Jesus something for us to be saved? It did. Well, it did the same thing anywhere as a Christian. Look at Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 15. He says this, says, and I really gladly spend and be spent for you. He's telling us to the church, I really gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be what? Loved. He gets, he'll, like, it's amazing how many times we get, we get things we take it for granted. Or things get overlooked. Right? That's how Christians Christians can be Christians will do the same with God. We really are. We all He does for us, and how much He loves us. We just take it, forget the goodness of God and, and the love of God, and how He's blessed us and how He's protected us. All that He's done for us, and then we get unthankful. Then we get disgruntled. We all be, okay, I go back and sit there. You know what, God, you are great. Then we forget about your Christian brothers and sisters in the church. How much a blessing they are to you and this ministry and this church and we start being unthankful. We want to pick out all the negative stuff. We want to pick out we always want to complain about something wrong. You have to do 99 things right. We gotta pick that one thing that's wrong. Stop it. That's the world. That's not Christ like that's not what Christians do. Amen. Well this church is not for me. It's not perfect. Well you're not gonna find a perfect church. I don't like these people here. Why? Because we're all imperfect? Join the club. Wherever you go, there's a whole bunch of imperfect people. You're not gonna, if, you know, it's because they might have a better name, they might wear a better suit, they might look a lot more flamboyant. They have imperfect people there too. Believe me, I know a lot of them. They're everywhere. Work, family, right? Work, family, church. You already know about politics. I'm not gonna go there. So, all right. So just that's how life is. Uh, turn it to the same uh, book, Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. I'll share this with you. So we're winding down, winding down here. Second uh, Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter five. Now listen here, what Jesus did for us. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one says this: For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So what did he do? It cost him something, didn't it? He was made sin so we can have righteousness. Do you know sometimes we just got to take the hit for the furtherance of the gospel, for the, to make a difference in someone else's life, to go ahead and proceed to see God be exalted and elevated amongst all things so he can get the glory in it. Don't be doing stuff for God and his church and his ministry so you can get the glory in it. It's not what we're here for. Amen? We're here for him to get the glory in it. So I try to tell you this, this morning, we need to absorb and we need to, to, to learn and we need to do exactly what Jesus said when it comes to uh, being exactly like the Samaritan, okay? A man that understood what mercy was and, and compassion was and be moved in a way that we can make a difference in someone else's life. Based on need, not worth. Do something about that feeling of compassion. It does something. You act on it. And it's going to cost something. But you know what it does, of all? And we mentioned this in the other verse in 1 John 4.19. It 
it demonstrates how true, how precious, and how right your relationship with God is. Because you're seeing God do the same thing in your own life, your own walk with Him. You're only, now you can demonstrate it to a Christian that might be in need, a newborn babe in Christ in need, or even a lost person that needs Jesus in need. Turn over, if you could, to 1 John chapter 3. And I'll close with this. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 3. I want to share with you three verses and we'll this will be our last point for the, the morning. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 16, says this. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our... For who? Okay, so now we're talking about other Christians. But whosoever has this... Look at But whosoever has this world's good... And see if his brother have need, and shut up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? Now I'm not talking about material things or money issues. I'm talking about everything. Like I said before, I, mean, I have never seen so many Christians that are hurting in churches and being lost in the mix of the multitudes in the church house. They lose content. That's why bigger churches are sometimes a danger because you get lost in the shuffle. You're not personal with people that are maybe grown in grace and matured in, in a great stature where you, they could be a great example and help and, and teach and, and help others in their walk with God to get stronger and keep encouraged in the faith. They get lost in the shuffle. So what they do is they come to church, they sit in there, and they just have to let the, let the church administer them in entertainment of music and a bouncing ball. Okay? Or the, the 15 different classrooms they have with different needs. And they go in there and they get the booklet. And by figuring out, they go ahead. Now, don't take this wrong. I'm giving you something to learn. But don't sit there and say, I'm, after you do all 12 lessons, I'm cured now. I'm a perfect Christian now. No, you're not. <laughs> it's, it's just a help in, those are things that help enhance your relation with Jesus to get closer to him. So what I'm trying to say this morning, listen, listen. The greatest way is, is having a, one, a Christian involve himself in a younger Christian that's new to this thing called Christianity. Or a hurting Christian, however they've been damaged or hurt, as a Christian, even though they might be saved, maybe 10, 12, 13 years. I'm going to tell you this right now. Look up here. There's a lot of Christians that are hurting because they're being taught wrong. Even in the independent, fundamental, Bible-believing churches. Well, they say they're Bible-believing. Because they're learning on the dictates of man's doctrines and not God's doctrines. They're going according to the church's structure. This is how it has to be. This is what you're going to do. If you don't obey it, then they get shunned and they get ridiculed and they get beat down. And they feel like they're, they're on the outside. It's on the inside. Even though they're sitting in a chair and every Sunday in church, but they're on the outs. And they're not being treated like a Christian, they're being treated like a dog. They did something like a no-no. And this preacher right here is fed up with it. I was ready to go old school on a few people. <laughs> I say, you and I got to have a talk. Going to the woods. Where are you and I going? Down a dark alley. Just me and you, bub. And these are people that are pastoring behind a pulpit. You say, do you have a right to? I'm telling you, I don't know where God's going to take this thing. Because how I'm preaching this message right here is going to be preached at that pastor's fellowship. So if you want to be part of my posse, <laughs> come on down. Because I won't probably go, I probably won't ever be invited there ever again after this one. But someone has to stop up and say, stop treating souls as numbers, but souls as lives. Right? Look up here. And guess what? Each and every one of us are going to stand at the judgment. Don't, hey, stop ignoring the need because it's, it's messing with your financial budget. Got quiet on that one. I said money. See, budget, financial, budget. And I also got quiet. Okay? Or 
You're messing with my golf time. Do you like golf, Pastor Pete? I can't stand golf. I like miniature golf. I can't stand golf itself. I can't stand it. What do you like? You're going to play a sport, play a real sport like basketball or hockey or football. Right? So you can at least hit somebody. Not a ball, but hit somebody, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> All right, let's get back. But listen, what you see here, <laughs> what you see here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, you see a cause. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, and here's the key word, but most people don't do, and in what? Truth. Do it according to the truth of the word of God. That you're demonstrating how pure your relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. How true God is to you so you can be true to them. You see what I'm talking about here? Being honest with some people is pretty good. But you've got to do it in a way that's going to be out of love. And not condemnation. There's a big difference. Can I tell you what churches do wrong a lot of times? And I hope we never fall in that trap. But tell me if I do it wrong. I want to know. But many times it's how our, our approach is. you agree with that? It's how we deliver it. It's how we approach it. It's how we go about it. So we need to make sure we show true clarity and truth that we truly do love you. But even then, sometimes they sit there, they're being, they feel like they're being attacked. Do you know what I mean? And our attention is not in to be attacked. We're trying to show you that, you know, I had to tell the, this, this, this young couple the other day that nothing matters but your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Because that's what you're going to be taking to the judgment seat. I mean, that's what you are. It's, it's, how is your walk with God and your talk with God and how is your relationship with Jesus? That is what you're going to take at the judgment seat. Amen? And as the pastor, as my, you as your pastor, that's what I'm looking at you. It's not when I look at Sean, what can I get out of him? I get like 50 hours of volunteer hours of, you know, I look at Paul. Maybe I'm not slaving him enough. Maybe I could slave him. I mean, maybe I could ask him to be a better servant. Maybe I could get him to maybe have him paint 15 rooms instead of just one. What can I do to what can I do to shake Joe down for more money? That he keeps hiding. You know what I mean? Right? That's what I can do. That's what I can do. I can shake him down. Right? No, 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 no. Can I tell you, look up here this morning. We need to be like the Good Samaritan. And look at all those things. And let, let, listen, don't be so hard-hearted. Let compassion hit the thing. Amen? Let's see it. All right, grab your songbooks real quick. Songbooks, we're going to go ahead and sing the 